This is the outermost edge of our solar system. We are over three billion miles from Earth. Our neighborhood seems vast from way out here, and at the very center is our sun. Even the most massive object in our system looks like a tiny point of light from this far away. But as we get closer, our perspective on the scale of things begins to change. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. With a diameter of only 58 centimeters, it was tiny by today's standards. But that tiny sphere started something very big for the human race. In less than 60 years, we have transitioned from a single, tiny beach ball-sized satellite to a sky filled with modern weather, communications, and navigation satellites, some as big as a school bus. These relatively giant pieces of technology can cost over a billion dollars to build and put into space. The tremendous cost has made the job of space exploration the sole domain of large governments. Until recently, agencies around the world like the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the United States have been almost entirely responsible for the human presence in space. That is, until a few curious scientists wondered if we could bring the spirit of Sputnik 1 into the modern age. Professor Bob Twiggs and Dr. Jordi puig Suari created a unique challenge for their students. Incorporate the capabilities of the original Sputnik 1 satellite into an even more compact one liter micro satellite. This was the birth of CubeSat. I had been at Arizona State for four years and we had a small sat program, um, but small in, in those days small, it was like 10, 15 kilograms, you know, um, a bigger box. And then I, I, I moved to Cal Poly uh, with a task to develop their astronautics program. Um, so at the point, at that point, I was really a lot more concerned about developing the right classes and the right curriculum uh, before I got into actually building satellites. Um, but but Bob was um, clever enough to grab me and say, "Hey, we're thinking about smaller things. Would you be interested?" And they were small enough that I felt comfortable, like, yeah, we could probably do something small and simple. That small and simple satellite was the very first version of what would be known as a CubeSat. The CubeSat standard is defined by a 10 cubic centimeter frame with compact off-the-shelf electronics inside. A CubeSat's low mass, relatively spacious interior, strength and flexibility all add up to an extremely affordable satellite. Another major benefit of this standardized frame is that it is completely customizable by the builders. For example, if you are doing an experiment that requires a gyroscope and an altimeter, you simply install those cheap components and you have a satellite that is custom made for those tasks. Likewise, if you instead require an infrared package and a temperature sensor, you can easily replace the original parts with these new electronics. The CubeSat project was purely developed as a way to get students to build very simple spacecraft and put them in orbit. Um, we had no idea that the pace of technology was going to keep going the way it did um, and shrink even more than we expected. Um, and then we, we again didn't expect that the students would decide to just grab it and throw it into their, um, into their, their satellites the way they did. So, no, that was... We knew we could do it. I mean, it, there was something to be said for the fact that we thought you could put a little Sputnik on a 10 by 10 cube. That, that I agree, we, we, we needed the technology to be small enough to do that. Um, but we have gone way beyond Sputnik uh, a long time ago. Following the first major CubeSat launch by Eurocot in 2003, a multitude of educational institutions and private developers began constructing CubeSats serviced by rocket launches from governmental and private entities alike. This was great news for the CubeSat standard but brought to light the new issue of fitting into the established NASA launch parameters and schedules. NASA needed the CubeSats to fit into a device known as a PolyPico Satellite Orbital Deployer, or PPOD. No, it's actually very interesting because um, what we have found, we're very intimidated by the traditional space players. We, we were very concerned when NASA said, okay, let's go fly on NASA missions, but you have to meet all our requirements on the PPOD, on the, on the deployment system. We were terrified. 
Um, because we thought it was going to be a lot of work. We don't know if we're going to do it right. You know, we're going to get creamed by these guys. And what we found is the NASA guys were awesome. They really wanted to do it, and they really wanted to help because they also see the benefits. As soon as they realized there was a better mousetrap in there somewhere, they were very interested in, in helping us make it feasible for them to go fly as well. And now we have a lot of NASA missions on CubeSat size spacecraft because they can do it, uh, and the scientists want to do it. The opportunity to fly on NASA missions gave a substantial boost to the acceptance of the CubeSat standard. However, scientists launching CubeSats were constrained by the NASA launch schedules dedicated primarily to larger projects. This created an interesting challenge. How would scientists leverage the affordability and flexibility of CubeSats without having to rely on NASA's launch schedule? The answer just might be in the works at the Idaho National Laboratory's Center for Space Nuclear Research. The CSNR is currently working on a radioisotopic-based, dual-mode propulsion system specifically designed to launch CubeSats. The project is funded through a NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Award and managed by the CSNR's director, Dr. Stephen Howe. We came up with the uh, concept of a Mars hopper uh, some years ago in 2009 as part of our Summer Fellows program. We do a lot of this brainstorming in our CSNR center here. We like to sit down and define what the problem is and then try to come up with maybe a new way of, of attacking it. And the problem, of course, with no range in a rover is that you want to land on a very safe location. So it's flat. It looks like a tabletop. Well, that's not where the interesting geology is. It's over in the canyons and the mountains, which are hundreds of miles away. So you really want to be able to get from here to there. So that led to a Mars hopper that could hop seven miles every seven days for, for many years, and we could cover the whole Mars surface. And uh, that didn't catch on. That was a little too extravagant uh, for NASA to get enthused about. And so then we started thinking, well, what other applications? We really want to get a way to go to, uh, like I said, Europa and Enceladus affordably and with a number of different missions to see if we can find new life form on a, on a totally foreign world. With the unused Mars hopper concept in hand and the dream of reaching other worlds in our solar system, Dr. Howe's team turned their attention to repurposing the hopper design for launching CubeSats. One of the first proposed missions for the CSNR's CubeSat vehicle is a voyage to the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. CubeSats may be uniquely qualified to explore certain aspects of these icy worlds. Nathan Jared is a research scientist at the CSNR and is the principal investigator on the vehicle concept. In the planetary science community, there's a lot of talk about um, life at these uh, satellites, like, uh, for instance, Europa that, that orbits uh, Jupiter. There's a lot of talk about a possible liquid water base, some sort of uh, environment underneath the, the crust or the ice shelf. There's also some thoughts of similar discoveries that Enceladus as well. There's some thoughts that these plumes might carry microorganisms that, that could really lead to the first discovery of uh, organisms on other planets. And so if we can try to look at fun, discovering that micro, uh, microorganism life on other planets and other satellites as well would be uh, a really big discovery, I think, to the planetary science community. So it's quite possible that the mechanism that formed life on Earth is forming life on Europa, but the chemical constituents will be different. Um, however, at the bottom of our ocean, it's never seen the sunlight, never seen the sunlight there. The fact that it's liquid water, temperatures are about the same, pressure's about the same. So conceivably, you can make both arguments. Could be look like us, might be totally different. And, and answering just that one question may be the important part is, would it look like us? A key component of the vehicle in development at the CSNR is its unique dual-mode propulsion system. It has the ability to utilize the radioisotope decay energy to either directly heat propellant, which generates thrust, or to generate high amounts of electricity for short time periods. That electrical power can, in turn, be used for electric-based propulsion or to provide power to other subsystems, such as the communication system. One of the CSNR researchers working on the technical challenges of this system is University of Idaho PhD candidate Troy Howe. So this is the computer-assisted virtual environment 
It's a laboratory in the case building. Um, what it does is it takes models and uh, computer images that you make and it puts them into a 3D environment so that you can you can turn them, you can go inside them, you can manipulate them and see it from a visual perspective and learn about it whereas normally graphs or charts or equations might be a little bit more difficult. So you can see in some of the visuals how it, it's much more clear when you're looking at a, a complete picture of your system than if you were just getting pieces of it or trying to imagine it yourself. So you can do changes to certain aspects of it and then visualize how, that, how the result is formed in a comprehensive environment. Because the CubeSats can use solar power to power themselves, they have to be relatively close to the sun. And so distances farther from the sun, like past Mars, they have a definite lack of power. Right now for long-term space missions like Voyager or uh, Mars Explorers, they use uh, radioisotope power sources which are materials that decay over time, like plutonium or uranium, and as they decay, they, they generate heat. And so that heat can be picked up and used as a power source, and it works for a long time. So plutonium has a half-life of around 90 years. So after 90 years, it's at half its power. If you had a system that was only designed to work for, say, 30 or 40 years, you still have a good quantity of power in that plutonium. And so you can send out long-term missions to explore and they'll still be able to generate power whereas a, a common chemical battery would run out immediately. Um, solar power can only be close to the sun. There's a lot of limitations on other power sources but the radioisotopes can provide it for such long periods of time and they're not tethered to the sun or anything. They can solve most of those problems. The propulsion system currently in development by the CSNR utilizes a method of gravitational escape called periapsis pumping. Essentially, the system fires its booster mechanism at the perigee of its orbit, its closest point to Earth. This creates an elliptical orbit that widens with every thrust at the orbit's perigee until a final thrust from the system can be imparted to achieve escape from the Earth's orbit. By leveraging the force of Earth's gravity, this technique allows CubeSats to slingshot out of the planet's orbit with minimal energy expenditure from the propulsion system. The CSNR is on the cusp of redefining mission opportunities for small satellites. Their vehicle is poised to allow these instruments to reach out beyond low Earth orbit and into our solar system for the first time. Like its cargo, this new class of vehicle will require the ingenuity and talent from the coming generations of scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and designers to prosper. Today's students will be at the forefront of this new era of space exploration. I think it's a great way of getting kids excited. Everybody says, you know, until five, fifth grade or sixth grade is dinosaurs in space. Um, and, and both of those things are kind of pretty far apart. You know, dinosaurs are a few million years behind us, and it's hard to bring them back. Um, and space is 100 miles up, and it's very hard to get there, or at least it was. Um, I think we're seeing a lot more interest of educators connecting with, with CubeSat as a way to, to teach the students but also to give them something to look forward to. Well, what I have found, we, we have high schools come visit us. You know, I, I talk with my kids' friends. Um, we go do outreach. Uh, you, you, it's very interesting when you can get an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old that was in high school just a few years ago that really can connect with those guys and goes and tells them, my spacecraft is in a rocket. It's going to launch tomorrow. That really connects with the kids because it's like, oh my God, I could be that person. One of the great benefits <clears throat> of these small CubeSat forms is uh, the recent push at uh, universities to build them and send them into space. Well, there's recently been a lot of work at even high school students in uh, high schoolers and technology classes that are building these CubeSats and they're uh, um, winning the opportunity to actually release them into low Earth orbit. So, in, instead of um, looking at a lab book and just kind of going through a, a very linear um, lab experiment, this allows you to build something tangible that will actually have application and geared towards a certain scientific s experiment, either in low Earth orbit or if we compare it to the a propulsion system to other celestial bodies. So the thing that I find most interesting about 
engineering and the science profession is that I can invent and innovate new things. So I'm confronted with a problem that needs to be solved, powering a satellite in deep space or finding a propulsion system to get your payload to where it needs to go. And you have the ability to think up new ideas and use what you've learned to invent new technology. You have the ability to take all of this new technology and use it to achieve a goal. I think that it's really liberating to be able to use all of these ideas that you might have to actually solve a problem. Just one thing, it is fun. And that's something that sometimes we forget. We're, we're all talking about the technical stuff and, and you know the engineering and the science and the processes and the testing and building these things. But one thing that people forget sometimes is that it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a team effort and it's intense and, and the kids are really passionate and I'm really passionate and everybody's having a ball. And then if everything goes well, you know, a year or two into it, you hear a beep and it totally makes your day. Um, and, and sometimes we forget that it's, it's, it, it's supposed to be fun and it is. Um, and it's very exciting. And I mean, we have a lunch coming on December 5th and I'm starting to get antsy and I'll be up all night and we'll listen for it and it will be a blast. Um, and, that's, and that's important to know as well.